Am I seeing okay? In you, yes. Okay. Oh, there we are. Great. Thanks, Richard. And I'm going to do a quick uh, intro here uh, to our to anyone who's uh, going to be viewing this. So, hi, I'm James Warda. Welcome to another episode of Coincidental Conversations, and uh, where we talk about how coincidences are always a uh, a portal to connection. And today we have with us uh, Richard Snow. Uh, Richard, uh, for uh, decades, was with the American uh, Heritage Magazine and was the editor in uh, editor in chief for uh, for 17 years. Uh, he has consulted on uh, many major motion pictures, including Glory, one of my favorites. Some really, really, really powerful, powerful moments in that. Um, he has uh, written for documentaries, including uh, the Burns Brothers, so including Civil War and others. And he has written multiple books, uh, many of which are on my uh, to-do reading list. And, uh, and we're talking today about uh, his most recent one, which is called Disney's Land. And, uh, you know, I picked it up and um, like so many Disney books, everything, I picked it up and it's like, okay, how, how is this going to be? And within those first couple paragraphs, I knew I had found something very special. So I reached out to Richard and uh, we're gonna have a conversation today. Uh, Richard, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really, um, really uh, honored to have you on this uh, on the show. Um, you know, and, and I really wanted to start at the, uh, at the beginning. You know, um, I loved it in the book, you talked about, you know, as a child, how you use your negotiating skills. Um, to go to Playland and then uh, Coney Island and then ultimately Disneyland. And um, I was wondering, what was it? I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I wanted to ask you, because it even seems like it was more passionate with you. What captivated you? What was it about amusement parks that drew you so much? I, 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 I sort of think that people roughly divide themselves into two categories, people who like circuses, and people who like amusement parks. And circuses have always given me the creeps. Uh, I mean, if a, if, if a clown isn't doing something scary, then, then somebody's trying to commit suicide up at the top of the tent, and they always made me nervous. But amusement parks, you're, I mean, I, I, child paradise, you're turned loose in a regular little city where you can walk around, make your choices, uh, great rides, um, some scary, but, uh, not all and, uh, and, and and testing yourself against the scares when you're little is fun. I just, uh, they got under my skin very early. And the ones you mentioned, uh, Playland, uh, I, I grew up in uh, Westchester, the suburb of New York and Playland was our nearest amusement park. And I certainly liked that. And uh, I, I, I had, uh, and when I was a little older, I, got a book out of the library, uh, I guess I was about 14, about, about Coney Island. When, and this, um, you know, it was way off in Brooklyn, a good 20 miles away. So <laughs> it, it, but, 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 uh, I was fascinated by that and badgered my father into taking me there. And that was great. But then we got our first television set, which, uh, you know, it's was, it was an old, great big piece of furniture with a screen the size of an apple. And Walt Disney appeared on it and started telling me about Disneyland. And that, that swept everything else away. All my, all my early fealty to my uh, local parks disappeared. I wanted to go to Disneyland. And, and you know, that brings up a question. I, I wasn't planning on asking it, but just when you, you just mentioned Walt, you know, people talk about Mr. Rogers, you know, and how he and his, the feeling kids got watching Mr. Rogers. How did you feel? Because you were a kid listening to this grown adult man talking about Disneyland, and like, what I, was it that resonated? I was too. I, I I I was I was too old for Mister Rogers. He always seemed vaguely sinister to me. <laughs> but, 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 but um, but but uh, when Walt Disney came on and told me about what was going to happen in Frontierland and. What, 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 what I'm like introducing Davy Crockett and stuff. He was, uh, he really, 
was, I think, at least for me, the uh, small child's ideal adult. I, I know he wasn't always easy to work with for his colleagues and stuff, but when, when he started talking, I had utter confidence in him and, uh, and the absurd idea that he was talking just to me. So, so I, I was drawn in right away. Uh, his, 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 his calm, vernacular, easy speech, and then telling about these fabulous things I could do, it, it was irresistible. So he, he was lucky he got to you before you became, a, before Mr. Rogers got to you in your teenage years, probably. Right, yeah, yeah, Mr. <laughs> yeah, I had a little outgrown Mr. Rogers. My children like him, but. <laughs> well, that's, um, so in, in, in reading the book, I really got the feeling throughout the book that it was, you know, it's kind of a cliche term, but it felt like a labor of love to me. Well, it very much was. It was an equally a labor of escape. I had, uh, I had just finished a book on the Civil War and was casting around for something else to do and came on a subject, I think, I think I was thinking about the early Air Force or something. And the more I studied it, uh, the more it felt like I was doing a terrible homework assignment and I hadn't been in school in 50 years. And uh, why, why is this happening? And then just batting around on the internet, I, I came upon Sam Genoway's book about the, uh, about the invention of Disneyland. And I thought, hey, this, this might be interesting. I like that place. Uh, and I ordered the book and it interested me so much that I started ordering other Disneyland books. And, and you know, it was still just uh, sort of a hobby thing. I didn't think I was going to write about it, but you know, two or three books in, I thought, come on, somebody's telling you something, Richard, you, you know, stay with, stay with this subject. Uh, you, you're, you're always interested in it as opposed to always wanting to go outdoors and stop it. So, so, uh, so that's, that's how I came to write it. And as you know, Disneyland has an endless vineyard of historians. And so it was, uh, it, it was relatively easy to keep expanding my, my, my Disneyland library. And I finally made a pitch to my editor at Scribner and uh, he, he said, sure, go, go ahead. Everybody likes Disneyland. And so I did. And what kind of reaction did you get when you told your family and, and friends and stuff that you're writing a book? I'm, that interests me. What kind of reaction did you get? Oh, they, uh... They, uh, well, I'm a, I think it was sort of, come on, Richard, everybody knows about this. <laughs> and then why do you want to do it? And I said, well, everybody, I, I do think everybody, every, every living American has a clearly embedded idea, I think, of what Disneyland is like. But I didn't, I, I, as, I as I was reading about its beginnings, I was saying, people don't know about this. People don't know that you know, the ABC television network came of age only because Walt Disney was willing to use them to uh, publicize his park. I thought this is full of interesting stuff. And then when I read a little more and saw everything that Disney was up against in building this park, you know, it was, he, he was one of the most famous men in the world, but he didn't say, now I want to build an amusement park. And everyone said, great. He said, now I want to build the amusement park. And everyone said, don't be crazy. <laughs> And it is, it is, it is, the more I read about it, the more interested I became, both in the, 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 his really admirable perseverance and, and, and all the obstacles he encountered. You know, it's funny because I'm going to point this out several times, I'm sure, through this conversation, the parallels between you and Walt. Because you just described when you talked about writing the book, how people said, well, why would you do that? And what, you know, yeah, everybody knows and, and you persevered. And when he thought of Disneyland, they said, why would you do that? And he persevered. Yes, well, our creations were of a considerably differing magnitude, but I did, uh, I, I, I did stick with it. And once I was, uh, once I was advanced enough to, uh, write a, to write a book proposal to show my editor, I, I, was, I, I was pretty sure that even though this is not a virgin field, um, People don't really know all about this, and it is a great story. Well, I've, I mean, I consider myself pretty, pretty experienced with Disney, just having read books and, you know, Neil Gabler, just so much about it, but so much in that book 
I knew nothing about that well, in your book. I was uh, I, I was very lucky in the, uh, you know, as I mentioned, my last book was on the Civil War, which of course has a, a endless galaxy of books about it. But I thought, you know, th th this will I'll, I'll I mean, how easy will it be to find stuff? Well, I really think Walt Disney has generated as many books as the Civil War. There, that, that I, I, I agree. It's, uh, somebody in back in two thousand uh, was doing a project on Disney and found that there were two thousand books in print about him. So I, 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 it was really the easiest research job. All I had to do was sit in my home and wait for these books to keep coming in. So this, this is something that's always fascinated me because I love history and biographies, et cetera, but there's a lot of research. I mean, you, you do extensive research. How do you decide, you know, how, what is your process for going through that and saying, you know, here's what I'm going to keep, here's what I'm not going to keep, and here's how I'm going to create a story out of this. Part of it, I, the part of it happens sort of semi Consciously, I mean, maybe you you tend to, I think writers, not all of them, but many of them, tend to want to arrange things in a narrative. And when it came to Disneyland, there were uh, there were a lot of fascinating there were a lot of fascinating little stories, but they could all go together like pearls on a string. I mean, I, I mean, the, the the overarching story was Disney carrying this through. But then there were so many chapters about uh, everything he had to do to bring this park about. He had to create a real and persuasive jungle in 12 months. He had to invent a new kind of tiny motor car that a kid could drive without killing itself. And, uh, um, it, you know, it was Jungle Cruise. What was it going to be? You know, there was a lot of talk about uh, the boat would steam out to an island and come back. And, he figured out no, no, that, that that there's 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 no way I could run more than twenty people an hour through a ride like that. So let's make it a closed circuit. I mean, the the so, so the the big story broke itself down rather nicely into little stories as, as, as each of the attractions came into the you know because Disneyland itself is a is a series of stories. Uh, there's you know you've got Mickey Mouse on the one side and pirates killing each other on the other and so uh so i just tried to you know do things in sequence but always keep an eye on what disney was thinking and 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 what he was coming up against because he had to invent everything there were no there were no all the there were really no off-the-shelf rides in that park i mean there had been an outdoor amusement industry in america for 100 years but a he didn't want anything to do with that and and when he started when he started one of the reasons people didn't want him to turn his efforts to an amusement park were not not just that they were sour natured but but uh at that time and right after world war ii the amusement park industry in america had had reached its low point uh, i mean that uh, there were there was you know, nice amusement parks everywhere. And then the depression came and people had to keep them going without paint, without, you know, without any maintenance. So by, by, by the time Disney started, started thinking of one, uh, really most of the uh, big American amusement parks were in a state of close to ruin. And they, his wife said, why do you want to do that? They're so dirty. And Disney said, mine won't be. And he was right. You know, it's... um. It's funny because it, it, as a story, just the Disneyland has all the key elements, right? It has that time urgency. We got to get it done within a, but before the opening. Yeah, he was, he, he boxed himself in quite early but because, uh, you know, he didn't, he, he, first of all, he had to find out even where to put it. He didn't, uh, you know, how, how do people get here? Uh, they they, 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 they uh, had to rely on, he knew he'd have to rely on parkways that, weren't even finished yet so he you know he got he got a group of people from Stanford who would uh, the Stanford Research Institute which was at that time figuring out where missile silos should go and he said where is where is everybody in California going to be in 10 years time and mm -hmm. 
it, it was all new research for SRI, but they kept they kept moving south. Everything close to Los Angeles was much too expensive. And they finally came to this clump of orange groves where there was nothing at all, and, except orange trees, of course. And, um, you know, Disney didn't have any rides to put in it. He had to invent all the rides. And, and in order to raise money to get the park, he, he even his brother, who was a, a brilliant businessman, they're, 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 like the Disney is equally dependent, you know, mm -hmm. Is, is equally dependent on Roy for his success of mm -hmm. anything else, but he, he wasn't interested in this. And um, Disney thought, well, hell, I've, 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 I've got to think this stuff up and get it all together. And I had to sell it to someone to make money. That there was no, uh, Roy, Roy was the financial reins of of, of the Disney M Enterprise, I think he offered him something like thirty thousand dollars, and Disney said no, no. And he, pe people have been after him for years to have a television show, and he'd always resisted that. He didn't want to give his cartoons away. He didn't want to, but now he thought, well, I'll find if I can find a television station that will pay for the park, I'll make a show for them. And he went to NBC and CBS and they both said what everybody else said, who wants a goddamn amusement park, this is no good. But ABC was in a pinch, it was the smallest of the three. And in fact, so small that uh, people would nickname it the almost broadcasting company. And uh, Milton Berle said, well, if the Russians ever drop a bomb, let's run over to ABC because they've never had a hit. And he <laughs> talked to the, to the oh. ABC people and convinced them. They, they were no more eager than anybody else to get into the amusement park business, but they, but they understood that both this might be the chance for them and Disney and, and they backed him. And, and it's significant. He didn't, he didn't call his show The Wonderful World of Disney or Walt Disney Presents. He called it right from the start, Disneyland. And, you know, we had a lot of his early films and stuff on the programming, but, uh, but every hour that that ran every week was a commercial for his park that didn't yet exist. And that's, that's how he was able to pull it off financially. Which is amazing because he really is a true salesman, right? Oh, a, a wonderful <laughs> salesman. Well, I mean, whatever whatever he was doing to me when I was 11 that totally swung me over he was able to and he he was uh he was famous he had I mean however skeptical people were this was Walt Disney this was the man who brought animated cartoons from a nasty little novelty to uh to to to, to a great art form and uh so people he, he had he had a fair amount of clout but even so it was an uphill trudge you know, it's funny because as you as you read the book, as I was reading the book, and he's he's finding all these vendors to build these rides that didn't exist, like I think Aero Manufacturing. Arrow, yeah, they, right? they, yeah, two two World War II guys. They both were mechanics on the same uh, Liberty and, ship or something, and they they opened a squalid little brick building where they were making cheap amusement rides, but he somehow. He thought they, these will be the people who make the car for Mr. Toad's ride. And he was, of course, as we know, a genius at choosing people because mm -hmm. Arrow built the nice little cars that Mr. Toad drives, but they also went on to invent the modern roller coaster when, when oh. you know, the, 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 those tubular tracks that allow you to fling yourself in a great lariat upside down. That, the, the roller coaster could do that. So, uh, so he touched people, he found people who had innate talent that perhaps even they themselves had no idea they were containing. It, 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 and it's sort of inspiring to, to see how that happened again and again and again. You know, and then, you know, if you, if you think about the sad part of it, you think about those few in your book who said, nah, you know, we don't really want to work with you or, you know, oh. 20 years down the road, what they would say. Yeah, who, you know. 
who could blame them? I mean, like the, the Art Linkletter uh, was. Uh, oh, right. He um he when he got in his when he when he bought his land uh they, he took Art Linkletter out there and said, and here, this is where the castle is going to be. And this sort of, this, this is a, all Art Linkletter knew was that he'd been driven 30 miles into nowhere. And, and Disney said, now Art, because they were very good friends, so uh, true friends. And uh, Art, now you buy stuff along here. I'm tapped out. I have no more money. But if you buy this land, it'll be. And Art Linkletter thought, well, he's a genius and I love him. <laughs> but nothing's going to happen here. And uh, this won't happen. And he, uh, he just lied to him. He said, I don't have any spare cash. And um, and then he later wrote in his autobiography, at every time I think of that little walk I took along the road out there, every step cost me a million dollars. Though he was, he, he, he did, he, we couldn't be too sorry for him because at the very end, when they were having to put on the big television show that was going to introduce it to the world, um, Art Linkletter, and Disney again broke, Art Linkletter said, uh, uh, I'll be the host. Uh, no, no, I'll do it for scale. Pay me $200 a day. Oh, and you'll give me uh, the rights to all the camera and film sales in the park for 10 years. And so he, he did all right, but not as all right as if he'd bought up Right. Orlando. Wow. <laughs> I mean, most of uh, yeah, most of the. Uh, <laughs> now, with with Walt, um, and just kind of probably with with everything you do as you're studying history, you know, there's, you know, there's contrary, you know, contrarian aspects to him, right? Because as you know, everybody saw him as warm and Uncle Walt and everything, but in person working with him was pretty difficult for many oh, people, right? It, oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. He, uh, he, uh, uh, one, at one point, so I remember one of his, uh, one of his animators had shown him something and he said, huh, you know, that's pretty good. And then he left the room and the guy's boss called him and said, come into my office. He closed the door and said, you remember this because this is the only time I've ever heard Walt give anybody a compliment. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, and yet he was, not, he, he was, he was open to things. People, they, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't bat away ideas, but he, uh, but as far, when it was, when it was building an amusement park, it might be, he liked to talk a lot about magic and you, you can't uh, raise capital on a dream and stuff like that. But he was as hard headed as General Sherman when it came to anything he produced and um and was not was not outgoing about it and yet he you know and yet he managed to attract and keep uh, one of the most brilliant workforces we've seen in the 20th century so now so for you as a child who was so inspired by this man and you know so passionate about what the, what he had produced and then you start researching him and i'm sure you knew before then but you find these other aspects of his character. I noticed how balanced your book was, how objective it was about him. How do you keep that objectivity about Walt and the other people you write about? Well, oh, because any 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 grown up has friends who are who are great in one way and perfectly awful in another, and you know it was he was. Even when he was, even when he was at his grimmest and most demanding, he was always interesting. But, but he wasn't easy to talk to. It, 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 it's like the PP, everybody said, you know, once the television show had made him a national celebrity. I mean, people knew what he looked like before that, but they hadn't seen him every day. Uh, they said, you know, you know who's most like I thought Walt Disney would be. That's his brother, Roy. He said, Roy, you could throw your arm around his shoulder. Roy, you could pat him on the back. You could no more pat Walt on the back than you'd slap, Walt, uh, you'd slap George Washington on the back. It, 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 he, 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 he was not an intimate person, but he, but he was, of course, a great communicator. So he, he, 
always made it clear what he wanted. He would not point vaguely at something and say, make that better. Uh, he would tell you what he needed, what it should look like, or what it should be. And, you know, in that, in that entire frenzy of building the park, because it, be, it had to be done in exactly a year because uh, he, was, uh, he was tied up with ABC and had to give the show on a certain date so there could be no overruns. And indeed, they were pouring the asphalt in town square the night before the cameras started rolling. Um, he always, he was always in communication with people and he lost very few of them. I think somebody is, uh, as tough and really as dictatorial as he could be, you'd think there'd be a, a, a lot of personnel driven away as he, as he went along. That didn't happen. There were very, 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 very few people who, uh, who, who were important to him ever said, oh, this is enough, the hell, I'm going to build my own amusement park. They, they, they stuck with him. Well, that's, you know, it does seem like it just at the core, there was a kindness, you know, like you have the stories of where he would give away bonuses and, and his employees oh, were playing, playing ping pong, you know, that's, you know. Oh, absolutely. One of his, uh, one of, one of his, he, he'd taken, a, he'd taken one of his hires off of, I mean, when he started doing Disneyland, it was, uh, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd lounge into an office and stand by a colleague's desk and say, and then and, and talk for, you know, perhaps a minute about his park. And the person would say, oh, that sounds interesting, Walt. And Walt would say, you're on it. Go, go start work. Because it was just, it, 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 but one of them um, did that and then went out and did whatever you do when Walt tells you to start an amusement park. And after a, uh, after three weeks, he ran into Disney in the hall and Disney said, hey, Jim, I don't, did I pay you last week? And he said, well, Walt, you haven't paid me for three weeks. And Walt said, oh, hell, that's bad. And he wrote out a check for four times the salary he owed him and then just kept that flowing for the rest of the guy's career. So this is not, you know, he was not, he, 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 he could have his moods, but he was certainly not a skin flint or a miser, and he certainly, a uh, miser, and he certainly, um, he certainly believed in rewarding his people. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, also a, a big fan, if that, if you can use that word of Abraham Lincoln, you know, and his, oh, well, yeah. right? He's worthy of fandom. <laughs> his, his writing and how, how modern, if you read his writing, it's it's like he wrote it today, you know. Um, interesting. He had a very, yeah, what we would call a very modern mind. Yeah, and that's, it, yeah, that's well put. You know, it, 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 precise, and and, and you, you read other stuff written by his contemporaries who were very gifted, and it all seems flowery and distant, but... Mm -hmm. But yeah, what says still has the real clang of metal. You, 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 mm. you, you can see the man. <laughs> and and Walt was a Walt also was a student of Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he loved Abraham Lincoln, and well, he made that amazing. Uh, you know, that's still there. It right. the, the, the amazing. Uh, the, the 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 hour with uh, the hour with Lincoln giving a, giving his speech, and that that came for the 64 World's Fair. That's a long, long time ago. It's a lot closer to World War II than it is now. But that, but that little show still makes the hair stand up on my head. I, I, I that, that was, I mean, that was amazing. It still is. And, and the two things that they share, which I believe you share, is that love of story, right? Both great storytellers. Yes. Now, now what do you think it is about the power of story, you know, what, what, did, what, did, what did they do so well, you know? And that's interesting about Lincoln because, uh, oh, people would say, oh, he's telling another one of his jokes and uh, more of his jokes are funny than anybody else's jokes from the 1860s remain funny. But, uh, you know, he wasn't telling his jokes just to get someone to slap on the knee. He was telling his jokes because a joke, even if it's short, is nonetheless a story. It has a narrative. And it's that they serve the same function for Lincoln that parables serve in the Bible, telling somebody, don't be bad, 
is not nearly as uh, powerful as telling somebody a little story in which someone behaves badly and something bad happens to them. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think both, uh, uh, yeah, Lincoln and Disney like the narrative. Uh, it's interesting, Disney, who you always, you know, cartoons, 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 he started by being funny. He hated a joke. He hated being told a joke. He, he liked being told a story, but he thought a joke was a waste of time. And, um, you know, I guess he, he was very visual. If you can't see it, it's not funny. And leave me alone. <laughs> but I, I just, I think of the times, and it's in your book too, where I think when he was trying to, first one, I think it was, was it Snow White, where he was telling the story and acting it out for all of his animators. Yes. And for Disneyland, he brought his whole group together to, to tell the story, right? Same, same thing. There's, 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 I use the, the, the Snow White story in the book because there's, because there's no actual account of what he said while he got, he got everybody together. He did the same thing he uh, did with uh, when he was pitching Snow White, which was the first feature length animated cartoon, which came up to more than a million dollars, which, which was, you know, as scary as Disneyland in the thirties. And he, he sent everybody out to a nice dinner first and asked them all to come together. And with Disneyland, he then just walked around the stage saying exactly what was going to happen so compellingly that they, they all they all joined in, but, but in so white, he just, he, uh, and, and that's what I quote from because he must have done something like this with Disneyland. He didn't just tell them, you know, she got into the scary forest and then the dwarf gave her an apple or the witch gave her an apple. No, he acted out all the characters, Sleepy, Dopey, Snow White. He, he basically did a, a, a one man hour and a half show and he won everybody over. I, I would I would give good money to have seen that. Can, can you, I, you know, just, I'd love to have heard him talking about Disneyland to his audience for the first time. No, everybody left exhilarated, and then they were and then they were very unhappy later when they suddenly found they were pulled off what they were doing and in the middle of it. Now had to now had to be part of this. <laughs> he, he didn't come back to give the talk every night. You got one shot, <laughs> and, then, and you're signed on. But just how he must have inspired people, right? But, boy. Yes, did he ever? Well, look, look how Snow White came out, and look how Disneyland came out. Yeah, and look at how we're we're talking about him right now, right? So, well, absolutely, and 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 people will be interested in him a hundred years from now. The other thing I noticed um, in reading your book, and then just reading about your other books and your biography, is just how some of the the same themes keeps there same seem to be themes in some of your books and work, like. Um, Henry, I know you've the book on, on Henry Ford, you know, that same kind of determination and passion that, you know, trains. trains. And, and, and the same kind of visual imagination. And Henry mm -hmm. Ford is a particularly interesting example because of, you know, he, he had this one fierce vision that nobody understood at the beginning that you can you can you can make a good car for two hundred dollars and you will change the world. Mm. And he saw that through with his world changing Model T. Uh, but once he once he was then the richest man in the world, just about he built what you could really call it's the closest thing I've ever been to to Disneyland and almost as charming. He's the people he was interested in the past and stuff he admired. He got. Thomas and Edison's laboratory from Menlo Park, New Jersey, where he'd, uh, where Edison had worked out the electric light, he brought it up to Detroit. He got the Wright Brothers uh, bicycle shop where they worked out their airplane. He brought it up to Detroit. He, he brought a, a courthouse in which Abraham Lincoln had practiced law up to Detroit and set them all down in this fantastic little village that uh, is in its way as charming is Disneyland. It's immaculately kept and you're walking through it and you see, Jesus Christ, this is Edison's desk and then uh, here's a, uh, but, 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 um, but he, he was also far, he was quite far sighted. He brought up slave cabins at a time when nobody wanted to think about them. And uh, so I, I would say if you've been to all the Disney places, 
go visit Greenfield Village in Detroit because uh, after because Henry Ford uh, because Disney went there and uh, and was enchanted by it and it, it, it played a a big role in encouraging him. He would have done Disneyland anyway, but uh, he was very much inspired by Greenfield Village. You know, um, I, I'm going to read you something here. This is from promotional copy for your book. And so I, I read this and um, so it said, Richard Snow brilliantly presents the entire spectacular story, a wild ride from vision to realization, an epic of innovation and error that reflects the uniqueness of the man's de of the man determined to build the happiest place on earth with a, watch, with a watchmaker's precision an artist's conviction and the desperate high-hearted recklessness of a riverboat gambler. Well, yes, yes. And, Is he put all his chips on the table on that one? Yeah. And, and you, um, when I read your book, I thought about how that also sounded like you a bit too. You know, um, watchmaker's precision Yes. You know, your book, again, I, I don't want this to be an hour of me just praising you, but nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but but being a writer myself, yes. um, I was I, I just am fascinated with the thought that you had hundreds, thousands of books to choose from source material. And yet the, the writing is so precise, um, so subtle. So obviously writers need uh, people, a support group and a support team. So, sure. so how do you like to work? Do you just go through draft after draft? Do you turn it over to an editor? How do you well, like to No, I, I, a lot of people, everybody, everybody works differently. I, um, you know, I've, I've known writers who will, uh, you know, outline a book before they put a word to paper, like a musical score. And uh, I, I can't do that. I have to sort of sop up what I'm going to be writing about and then remember where I saw it and then go back and try and arrange it in order. But they, they, they but the precision point you bring up, I, I, uh, I mean, for instance, uh, there were many examples of Walt uh, being, some would have said, given the, the financial plank he was balancing on the end of, were, were, was being ridiculous. But uh, but he but he understood that people people respond to effort, people respond to care, people respond to precision. And uh, he was talking to his uh, his uh, pretty much his second in command, one of the people he finally did dump. Though, though he had been very useful to him, a guy named C.B. Wood, who was sort of the manager when they were putting the park together. Uh, and Disney was building his main street. And on the main street were, you know, these elaborate turn of the century buildings. And an awful lot of them had cast iron tracery, ornamental ironwork along the top. And this was, you know, 50 feet up in the air. And Disney was having it wrought by blacksmiths so that each little iron spike and wood would but this drove wood crazy he said wall wall it's 50 feet up plastic black plastic no one will know the difference and he said yes they will mm -hmm. and he truly well when he was at, at, at when he got on this beloved railroad it, one of the first things that drew him in as you know or for the trains he uh you know that they were they're 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 real working trains, but they're three foot gauge. They're, 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 they're a miniature scale, but he'd laid the tracks and the rocks that formed the ballast that the tracks were on. This is after the trains were up and running. He was walking along the track, getting more and more disgruntled. And he finally said, damn it, these rocks are too big. This ballast is too big for the train. He had a mile and a half of track ballast reground to fit on this. This is what he didn't know if he was going to be able to buy supper in two years. Uh, it, it, it's very it's sort of inspiring. Well, it, inspiring is one word. I can imagine if he was your boss, you might be going. I mean, if I'm my boss, I would have cut my <laughs> food. Yeah. But, there's any ballast. But then at the end, when you'd see the 
the result of it, then you'd go, ah, okay. Yes, and it all, and, and it does make sense. The last time, the last time I was at Disneyland when I was working on this book, I was remembering that and trying to imagine how it would have looked if all those chunks of stone the trains were rolling over were larger and it would have looked bad. It wouldn't have, I, I might not even have noticed it, but there was something that would have been a little sour, a little out of tune. The, 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 he fine-tuned everything, every, every sight line you work in that park. He, bought, uh, 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 he got a very wonderful landscape woman named Ruth Schellhorn to, uh, to do the final planning of the trees along Main Street as you approach the castle. And the trees had already been planted, but he thought it was too stark. It was just like walking down a long avenue of trees and then there's a nice building at the end. He said there should be some mystery and she was a very brilliant landscape artist and understood entirely. And so every tree was moved this way or that way by two feet, a yard, so that as you walk toward the castle, you're witnessing a sort of visual strip tease. A little bit more is showing with each step and it draws you on as opposed to just being a destination. Yeah, I, I know in, in, in the book where it says that he'd go out in the morning <laughs> and he'd say, I want that tree moved over there. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and moving, yeah, yeah. Well, you know how easy it is to move a tree and right. these, were, these were big trees. No, he, he was right, right, right down till the very end. He, 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 uh, and uh, and he, how they how they drive around the different neighborhoods looking for trees for Disneyland, and they bought. Oh yeah, yeah. So that, that was that, that, that was his, 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 his tree people hated that job because they had to. You know that that. that he had a good supply of trees in that the Santa Ana freeway that was going to lead to Disneyland was taking a lot of them down and he had squads moving ahead of it and simply getting the trees out of the way, but he needed bigger, richer, lusher trees. So he had people go up and ring people's doorbells and say, that's a nice banyan tree in your yard. Would you like to sell it? And you can imagine how this was received, but he got a lot of fine trees that way. What one, one, what one person simply said, Oh, that old bastard, I'm so sick of it, I could die. Take it away, it's yours. <laughs> so you never go away, you know. Is that the one, there is one tree you said is the oldest thing in Disney. Canyon. It was a, yeah. yeah, it was from one of the, uh, what, yeah, one of the, uh, one of the, one of, I think, 14, 16, I don't remember how many uh, of the original landowners he had to buy out. And one of them would only sell it because they had, the family had planted that tree in 1896 and one of the daughters had gotten married under it and he said Walt I won't I, I, I can't sell it to you unless you will promise that you'll keep this tree alive and this is the sort of this is the sort of thing that did not make Disney grumpy he said of course I will and there it is it's right it's right it's right out in front of the Indiana Jones ride now incredible the oldest, oldest living thing in the park incredible um just a just a couple of more few more questions um so the you know in what's interesting is i've moved i i told you i moved recently to orlando and uh st cloud and there's in i noticed in st cloud they've got a beautiful little downtown a little you know one of those little downtowns you just want to walk around and yeah. and in your book you talk about how Main Street and Disneyland actually inspired a lot of renovations of Main Streets across the country. That's yes, and I think this is underappreciated. That that the, the, the Main Street was, you know, this didn't look like a the, the it was a Main Street of Disney's youth, which would have been raw, gutted, uh, stripped of trees because the buildings had just gone up. But the buildings he put there are, are like very gentle caricatures of the real buildings Americans were putting up then. So if you walk along that street, they, uh, they exude a familiar comfort that is at once uh, friendly and playful. And, and he got all the elaborate Queen Anne architecture right. And, and again, all that ironwork, not plastic. And 
uh, this has taken off. And it, uh, I think Medina, Ohio was one of the first towns. They were about to uh, pull down their old courthouse and, uh, you know, build some Bauhaus stuff out near the new McDonald's. And, um, and so somebody had come back from Disneyland and said, look, you like Disneyland. We like Disneyland. We've got something as good as Disneyland if we just paint it and take care of it. And they did. And the downtown Medina is uh, sort of famous now as being a, a perfect American turn of the last century small town. And this happened all over America. And mm. I, I think a lot of, uh, an awful lot of very fine and worthy architecture would be dust now if it hadn't been for Walt Disney's fanciful idea of what the main street of his youth promised, if not actually delivered back then. You know, and that's the thing, when I walk around the downtown in St. Cloud, it's, it's a feeling I get, you know? And I heard um, Kyle Cease, who's, in, who's a, a coach and author, he said, you know, you're not selling a product or service, you're selling a feeling. So yeah. that's why I wanted to ask you, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up here, the feeling that of Disney, if you can take us back to that story that inspired you, you know, as, as a youth. Well, it's certainly, you know, had, it, it's certainly the feeling he had a, had a tremendous impact on my now quite long life. I was, I, I whined my parents into sending me out to my nice aunt and uncle who, 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 who lived in Los Angeles and they took me to Disneyland uh, in 1959. They just finished the Matterhorn and, and the submarine ride. And, and it was just as, I mean, there was no disappointed expectations here. I was absolutely enchanted by it. Oh, my, my. And it's funny, my, uh, again, to his, to, to his getting things right and real, my uncle had worked on acoustic homing torpedoes in World War II, and he got on one, on one of the Disney submarines for the submarine crews and said, my God, he's even gotten the smell right. And, uh, but I was turned, you know, they, they, they took me around and then they, the, the, then they, then they just turned me loose for hours and hours and hours and everything was wonderful, the Peter Pan ride, the jungle ride with the guy shooting the hippo. And, but the thing that stayed with me most was when I was right, right at the end of the day when it began to get dark and the light started coming on along all those gingerbread buildings and there was a horse car clopping quietly by and uh, it was suddenly twilight in a, on, a, on a tranquil American small city street in 1908. And I suddenly thought, I want to stay here forever. And in a way, I managed to do that in that this got me interested in American history at that moment, which expanded to, to a larger interest in American heritage, in American history. And I, I, uh, I, I got a, lucky enough to get a job at American Heritage Magazine and even luckier to be able to edit it after a while. But, but I really do think that I've, you know, that, 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 that in, in fomenting in me that specific particular interest in history, Walt Disney put bread on my table for my whole life. And I'm very grateful to him. That is such a powerful story. And, and, and what, what strikes me is what was that? You were 11 at the time? Is that right? Uh, yeah. What's that? 1959, I, yeah, 12, yeah. Oh, what that 12 year old was probably feeling at that moment, you know? Mm -hmm. It was, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't thinking, gee, this is a nice example of Gothic revival. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just getting a total feeling of, 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 of comfort and promise. Mm. And, um, it, it still hasn't left me. Wow. Wow. So um, t two more questions. First of all, so first, um, are there any new projects underway? Any anything new? Are you are you taking hopefully a much needed break? <laughs> no, no, uh, no, 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 no more on Disney. I've, uh, I've got, my last book was about the Civil War Navy, and I've gotten a, 
I've gotten drawn back to the American Navy. I don't fall very far from the tree. My father was in the Navy in World War II, so that's always interested me. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm back with the Navy, but it's, uh, it's interesting, but it's, but I've never enjoyed working on a book more mm. than on Disney. He is, he is great company and all of the people he got working for him are great company. Uh, the, 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 the ones, the ones that stayed with him, so many of them wrote, you know, funny, fascinating books. I mean, of course he, you know, it, it wouldn't be a group of accountants. They're, 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 they're imaginative people, but there was so much enjoyable literature spawned by the builders of Disneyland. I, I, I still feel that that whole couple of years was vacation. That's wonderful. Um, last, last question. Um, so, you know, the, the quote, you know, I used to think it was from Walt, but after reading your book, I'm not sure it's more attributed to Walt was, you know, it all started with a mouse. Yes. Right. Yes. He, he, he certainly, I think, I think it was one of his PR guys who came up with that, but he, uh, but you know, this is a man who knew what to pick and choose. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. And he, he, and he said that he said several times on his television show, just remember, it all started with a mouse mm. and uh yeah if he didn't come up with it himself he uh it certainly articulated a feeling he had and understood um so with that if i had if you had to finish that sentence for your own career it all started with a it all started with twilight on main street in 1959 i you know <laughs> it's a little embarrassing but um but not so embarrassing that I don't want to express my gratitude. Well, Richard, um, thank you very much. This really has been a privilege. I'm going to- uh, So enjoyable. I, uh, I'd like to start the book again. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it, I, I just read it again. I actually give it as, as uh, I gave one as a, you know, just a thank you to somebody who was on this, on my uh, series, uh, Lou Mangiello, he, um, he runs a WDW radio and uh, I think that is a thank you too. So it's two thank yous. Oh, there you go. Uh, and uh, so thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'm going to just do a sign off here to our viewers. Uh, thank you also for joining us. Uh, you can probably tell that I really enjoyed this one and um, look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Coincidental Conversation. Thanks a lot.